What does it look like to be pro-life in a post roe world? What do we do when we feel uncomfortable with having some of these conversations? And what does it look like to live out a life-affirming philosophy, life-affirming principles? What does it look like in every part of our lives and all of our relationships to be truly life-affirming? That is what is coming up today on the Possibility Mom Live with my very special guest, Stephanie Gray Connors. Being pro-life, having a life-affirming attitude, these can have I'll call it baggage. They can definitely have some baggage depending on who you're talking to. This might have very positive associations for some of you. This could have challenging associations for some of you. For some of you, the word pro-life might have a connotation of being um, uh, on a fight maybe, or perhaps being pro-life means something very deeply personal um, and very tender for you. So I'm very excited about this conversation today. My hope is that it presents a very tender and a very personal approach. There are many things that you can find on the internet about how to have a conversation with someone about abortion, how to um, perhaps, uh, you know, lovingly challenge someone. But today I'm hoping to contribute to the conversation in a very tender, a very personal way, and very much in line with the work that I do at the Guiding Star Project. Today, if you are watching this on YouTube, I am wearing my Guiding Star merch, which I'm very excited about. It's my first Guiding Star physical paraphernalia. If you're not familiar with the Guiding Star Project, we are a sisterhood of life-affirming medical centers across the United States where we seek to protect women's fertility and identity as mothers. I am so honored to serve as president of the Guiding Star Project. We have some very lofty goals to increase the reach of Guiding Star across the beautiful United States. And yes, I'm doing it from Canada, which still makes my mind laugh a lot, but that is okay because the Lord has a sense of humor in so many areas of my life. But I encourage you to take a look at Guiding Star Take a look at what it means, and this is what I, this is this is what I what I want to bring to this conversation is what does it mean to be pro life? Today is the March for Life in America. We did not schedule this. I find it very interesting that this happened on this day. Did not intentionally schedule this interview. So the March for Life in America, in in on Capitol as well as in various cities, are having their own marches for life. I grew up with that image. That was what it meant to be pro life. You, I know this might sound, and let me know if you're watching this live, if this, if you resonate with this, like the, the main association when I would hear the word pro-life, literally the first thing that comes to mind would be like a sign, somebody with a sign, right? And I'm curious if that is a common, you know, first image that comes up for someone. But now, especially in the work that I do in Guiding Star, and especially with the fact that I am a mom of 10 kids on earth and one in heaven, being pro-life takes on a very different form. Being pro-life for me is now, I mean, it always was, but it's a way of life. And especially as I'm now in this Guiding Star organization and thinking about what does it look like to offer pro-life medicine? There's some obvious answers to that question. But also, what does it look like to receive someone in a foyer, in a, in a welcome, uh, you know, the front door? What does it look like to be greeted by the, the, the receptionist or your front door staff? What does it look like to be cared for? How does a midwife approach someone? How does an OB approach someone? How does everyone who encounters any patient or client what does it look like for that to be a lived out experience? So whereas before the word pro-life to me would just sort of have images of a sign, now I think of it as a very um, much more holistic, um, truly wraparound, uh, and again, like a way of life. 
And so I want to touch on some of these things. My beautiful guest, Stephanie Gray Connor, has a brand new book out, My Body for You, a pro-life message for a post-war world. I am laughing that we are doing this on the day of the National March for Life. Stephanie Gray Connors, welcome to the Possibility Mob. Thank you. It's a joy to be with you. How funny is that we're doing this on this day? I honestly did not make that connection when I booked this interview. Right. Yeah, I know it. I mean, the Lord always orchestrates things perfectly. And so this is just another example of that. Stephanie, for anyone who might not be familiar with you and your work, could you introduce yourself? Sure. So I have been working full time in the pro-life movement for more than two decades. And I was inspired at the age of 18 by a pro-life speaker who said there are more people working full time to kill babies than there are working full time to save them. And I had grown up in the pro-life movement, been super involved, but those words really convicted me to consider making it my life's career. And so I spent 20 years in the realm of pro-life apologetics, doing debates, lectures, teaching people how to argue winsomely. Um, and, and then I dove into writing in the last, I guess, eight years. And uh, now I'm a mom. And so uh, I still am involved in the pro-life movement to a lesser degree than I, I was in terms of traveling, but still getting the message out, hence the recent book and, uh, and doing stuff like this. We have some fun personal connections. So we, we had dinner in my living room and I'm trying to remember what house it was. I'm almost positive. Did you live in Scarborough? No, I think you came and visited us in my home in North York. I'm North York. Okay. Yes. That rings a bell. Yes. North York. Yes. We, we, you know, you knew my husband who worked um, at all the campus ministries, almost all campus ministries. Right. In Toronto, so you had connected with my husband, Josh. Um, we tried, I hope you don't, can I say this publicly? What we tried, sure. to, we tried really hard to set Stephanie Gray off, which she was just Stephanie Gray, <laughs> our very dear friend, because we were like, how are you not married? And our, <laughs> our dear friend, we were like, how are you not married? We tried to put them together. It was not a. Uh, it was not successful. But you are now beautifully married to the person you were supposed to marry. Um, tell us, well, but it was another setup, eh? So I'm good friends with Lila Rose, mm -hmm. and Lila set up my husband and I. Stop it. Okay, yes. tell us, real quick, tell us that story. How did? First of all, what did she? What made her think? Ooh, this two would be a great pair. And yeah, then, it's it's actually it's it's a great story because. One of her dearest friends from college married uh, my now brother-in-law. And so Lila knew through this friend of the Connors men. It's, it's a family of five boys and one one girl. And that these were all really good guys. And so eventually she met um, uh, some of the, the Connors and uh, met my now husband. And when she met him, she just thought he would be really good for Stephanie. So she tried to set us up in 2016. And we emailed for a few weeks, but I was living in the West Coast of Canada. He was in the East Coast of the U.S. And it's like, oh, do I want to do long distance? So long story short, we email for a few weeks. I shut it down before we ever went to phone, before we ever met. Um, and four years go by with no contact. And then uh, when I was almost 40 and I had been like, okay, God, I want to be married, but it doesn't seem like that's my reality. So I'm going to put down roots. I'm going to buy a condo near my family. I'm just going to, you know, make my life in British Columbia. Um, my spiritual director visited me and blessed my new home. And I start sobbing and I'm like, I have this beautiful home and no one to share it with. And so he's, I mean, he's a Byzantine monk. So I mean, they're just epic and dramatic with everything they do. So he's like, got his hands on me. He's praying over me and I'm sobbing. He's got his cross out. He's pressing it into my forehead. And at that exact moment, and we know this because of a text, um, at that exact moment across the continent, after four years of no contact, my now husband is flossing his teeth and I pop into his head as he's getting ready for bed. And he thinks to himself, I wonder if that Stephanie girl is still single. And he grabs his phone and he texts Lila. So we know from the timestamp of that text and when father was praying over me. And so he texts Lila and says, is, is your friend Stephanie still single? So long story short, um, she then contacted me and said, that Joe guy reached out to me. Would you be open to reconsidering and trying again? And so uh, we reconnected and then a work trip brought me near him and we met. And the moment I met him, I was like, oh my gosh, Lila was right the whole time. Like I, I've never been more wrong in all my life. <laughs> 
and so grateful that God is merciful and and let a reconnection happen. So um, we met and married really quickly and life has been bliss ever since. Oh, I love it. Thank you, Lila Rose. <laughs> since I'm sure you sent her gift baskets. Yes. Um, so you have spent essentially what, 20 years, right? Or more than 20 years. More than 20 years, yeah. Uh, on this topic, I had heard you as a very young person many times. So when I was in college, I attended several of your talks. The different universities brought you out to Toronto. And so I had attended you before we were friendly, right? I had been listening to you. Uh, but I have always had, or, or, or sorry, when I was younger, it, 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 I had this connotation, you know, what I brought up when I opened this podcast of just being pro-life means you have a sign. And being pro-life means you stick your neck way out. And being pro-life, um, if I'm being just very vulnerable, had a bit of a negative connotation to me, very like heavy baggage. I, I believed wholeheartedly, of course, in the in the you know in the concept, like meaning uh, I knew that it was wrong to kill a baby, but to be very public, to stick your neck out was very challenging to me. How common do you think is my was my outlook? Well, I think a lot of people think that, and it does involve that. And there are some people like in my, in my experience that are called very specifically to a type of activism, confrontation of the culture, education, and so forth. But the reality is if that's not someone's specific path to living out the pro-life message, it doesn't mean they don't have a path at all to living out the pro-life message. And so we need to broaden their understanding as, as you indicated to what does this look like being a mother, being a father? What does this look like as a physician? You know, I was recently speaking to an amazing pro-life physician who was telling me about a patient that had been connected to him. And the patient uh, had a very complicated condition called premature rupture of membranes, which if that happens before viability is very dangerous for the mom because an infection can result. And then if it's before viability, the, the, the baby can die. Um, so most doctors would just induce labor, the baby's too young to live, and, and that's that. And this doctor said, hold on, why don't we try to do everything possible to reduce the infection risk, put her on, you know, a high dose of antibiotics, pelvic rest, close monitoring to get her to the point of viability and see if we can keep this baby alive. That was a very pro-life attitude. And not only did they get to 22 weeks before she was put in the hospital, but they managed to keep her pregnant in the hospital till week 26 or 27. And that little girl today is six years old. Wow. So that's an example of what does it mean to live the pro-life message? Did that doctor get on a street corner with a sign? No. Did he write a letter to a newspaper? No. But he lived the pro-life philosophy in his interactions with others and a life literally was saved as a result of that. So um, we, yeah, we definitely need to broaden our understanding of, of living a pro-life worldview. You know, it, it's it's. I read that in your book about how you had heard that quote about there are more people working full time for for the pro choice side mm -hmm. um, than in the pro life side, and and that's very much been impressed upon me now in my work with the Guiding Star Project. We need physical structures, like we need we need um, places where care is um, given, and again, where and even employment for pro life practitioners, I think, is a huge passion of mine now. Um, what, where, Give us some examples of um, things that you are really inspired by right now when you see, in regards to this, people being employed full time. What are some things that you love uh, right now? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the first one that comes to mind, and it, it is full time, although employed probably isn't, isn't the, the best word, is the Sisters of Life. I absolutely love that order of nuns um, who began under the leadership of now deceased Cardinal John O'Connor in New York. And uh, they have spent, uh, I think it's also over two decades. They were created in the 90s. Um, and they're just this beautiful community that of women who dedicate their lives to serving women in crisis who are considering abortion, who would pursue abortion if it weren't for the love, compassion, and practical help, including opening their convent doors to live, that the Sisters of Life offer these women in crisis. So uh, it's more than a career for them because it's actually a vocational call, but they, they really on every level 
are, are dedicating themselves full time and beyond as, as spiritual mothers. So that's something I'm, I'm super excited by. Then there's other, you know, care homes and approaches that really journey with women. I think I also mentioned it in my book, um, uh, Mary's Shelter, which is a wonderful outreach for women in crisis in the Virginia, D.C. area. Um, I'm friends with the B. Wright family. David B. Wright's a wonderful speaker and his wife, Margaret. Um, has been very involved in in that ministry. And then all the educational groups. I mean, for years in Canada, I worked for the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform, and they've just done a ton in terms of education. So we need people working full-time ministering to women. But we also need people working full-time on the front lines, on college campuses, and other public venues to actually change the hearts and minds of people so that if they're ever in a situation of crisis, they come to the health center instead of the abortion clinic. So we need to change how they view the baby, how they view abortion. And so my work with them and other like-minded groups, um, certainly, as I mentioned, Lila Rose, my friend who is the head of Live Action, they do great work and they have a huge staff. So, um, you know, there's so many groups now. And I think when I heard those words in 1999 about the imbalance between full-time workers on each side of the debate. There are so many more ministries now, 20 plus years later, that do have full-time staff and not just volunteers. Volunteers are great, but if that's all you have, then you don't have people dedicating the same quantity of time that a, a, a full-time employee could. Yeah. And so the exciting thing is there are just so many groups that exist now that didn't exist back then. Yeah. Ooh. So we're both moms. I'm a mom of 10 with one in heaven. You have lovely Violet, who is yes. old. how old is she? So she will be two and a half in a few weeks. And uh, and then I'm pregnant right now, 29 weeks along. And then I have four babies in heaven. So let's talk about how your outlook on, on, on <laughs> this is the most open-ended question, okay? Yeah. <laughs> How did things change for you in regards to you being this, this message, this uh, living out this message of hope, um, in a, as particularly in a post world world? How did that change for you when you became a mom? Oh, I mean, generally on every level, and then I can I can get into specifics. But I mean, I always knew that parenthood was both beautiful as well as challenging. My sister has five children, and I was the aunt that was very involved in their lives being single for so long. And um, so I was very present and active in my sister's family, my cousin's family, my friend's families. So I saw the beauty of motherhood as well as its challenges. But it, it, there's nothing like becoming a mother yourself, where you experience these two extremes, you know, like, I, I I start my book writing about my experience of labor and just how brutally painful it is and, and how I declare to my husband I should have been a nun. <laughs> because in the midst and the throes of the of the agony of birth, I suddenly thought, well, if I had been a nun, I wouldn't be going through this pain. But then the ecstasy follows of the baby coming out and the beautiful bonding and just uh, the, the sheer joy. There aren't even words to capture of of not only having a baby, but your baby and the baby that is the product of the love between you and, you know, the most amazing person you've ever met. So, um, but then after that, we, it's, it's like a roller coaster. It swung again. And I write about this in the book that for me, breastfeeding was a huge challenge. It was something I really wanted to do. And my daughter would not latch for three weeks. So I was tethered to a pump so I didn't lose my supply. And, and we kept trying to get her latch. It was so brutal. But then we got into this, this groove and everything was fine. And um, when she was about six months old, my husband and I were at mass and he was holding her and she started to fuss. And at that point with everything good with breastfeeding, I was feeding on demand and soothing her that way, whenever. So he passed her to me and I sit down and I'm looking down at her as I'm latching her and she starts to feed on me at the exact moment in the mass of the consecration. And so as I'm looking down at her feeding, she, I'm listening to the priest say, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And of course, being a cradle Catholic, I've heard those words my whole life. I have been to countless masses. But in this moment where my body is being given for my child and she's literally consuming me, and in about 10 minutes, I will have an opportunity to literally consume the body of Christ through the Eucharistic host. It just put motherhood and the human experience into a whole new perspective and um, really became a defining moment for me and and um, how I really think we as a movement 
need to direct our messaging to the culture that especially in this post row world, everyone's chanting, you know, my body, my choice. And I think the best response is the words of Christ. No, it's it's my body for you, that we are made for self-sacrificing love. And men and women at the height of our maturity are called to motherhood and fatherhood. That might not be lived out physically, biologically, like the sisters of life for them, it's spiritual, but everyone is called to be mother or father, to be nurturer, protector, provider, carer, to be attuned to the needs of the other. Um, and so motherhood is has taught me that in a whole new way and therefore influenced what I want to tell the culture as it relates to abortion, while at the same time still acknowledging with the sleep deprivation and the attitudes you get from a child that it's hard and you have to try to keep it together when you don't want to keep it together and you lose your temper and you're like, this is a path to virtue. This is a path to holiness. This is a path to heaven. I have I have 10 very strong virtue builders for Lisa Kennedy <laughs> in my life. Let's talk about virtue building. Okay. So many people who will be listening to this podcast or watching live are entrepreneurs and there is a tremendous amount of virtue building, virtue growth, growth and virtue in being an entrepreneur and being a mother. What has your experience been like? You, you obviously are uh, still working in some capacity while you are pregnant and while you have um, a young child. What has been, okay, let's, let me ask you this. Like what's been What's been so helpful to you? Like give us one one tip or one strategy that's been so, so helpful in terms of balancing it all. And what do you find the most challenging? So for sure, I think what's been most helpful is support. Realizing we aren't meant to do life alone. We aren't meant to do motherhood alone. Um, you know, man was not meant to be alone. God tells us that at the very beginning of Genesis when he created Adam and there was yet to be Eve. And, you know, we often look to that passage to think, oh, that's why I need a life's partner. That's why I need a spouse. And and certainly we can extrapolate that from that, but it's more than that. Humans were made for a communion of persons, support, connection, and community. And so for me, having the support of other uh, like-minded moms, you know, that I can go to for advice and insight, how, how do you balance, you know, taking care of the home and passions and interests you have with meeting the needs, the very legitimate needs of your child and um, making sure they're fulfilled and flourishing. Um, and uh, having a very supportive husband, you know, I'm my husband and I, he, we're both from the West Coast. He's from the West Coast of the US. I'm from the West Coast of Canada. So we actually don't have any family in town. So we've been very blessed to have a supportive church and friend community. Um, but the other thing is that that he has, you know, a, a flexible schedule that he can allow for uh, taking care of our daughter right now. <laughs> well, well, I'm doing something like this. So it's, it's just discerning um, how we can get the support to do the things we feel the Lord is is calling us to do while not losing sight of that primary call and vocation of of being a good wife and being a good mother first and foremost, and then everything else kind of flowing out of that. Um, I think the hardest thing is, you know, and speaking of being an entrepreneur, like the, the Canadian Center for Bioethical Reform that I used to work for, I co-founded back in 2001. And I was 20 at the time. I was still in college. I was doing a political science degree. So I wasn't even taking like business management or anything. And I suddenly found myself in the subsequent years essentially an entrepreneur. Like I essentially started like a nonprofit. I was essentially a CEO without even realizing what a CEO was. And I remember thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to oversee staff. I don't know how to oversee projects. I just am passionate about this issue and I have certain skills to speak and write. So I found myself continually going to bookstores and going to the business section and all this like self-taught info. I was like eating up all these business books. And then I started to get mentors and I would talk to other people that were in ministry and how they dealt with challenges and how they thrived and so on and so forth. And I found myself now as a mom in, in the same situation. Obviously, I was raised by a good mom. But I don't remember the first few years of her mothering me. That's when we don't have memories. And that's where I'm at right now. And so I find myself constantly thinking like, 
what do I, what do I do when she won't nap? Or, <laughs> you know, how, do, how do I respond and teach her this particular thing? And so I'm finding myself eating up mothering books and talking to mentors. And so I think that's the key is when it gets hard and when you don't feel well equipped, then you just get equipped and you start to seek out help. I'm curious if you have strong opinions about what I'm about to say. I have a feeling <laughs> you do. There are, especially on Instagram, you can see a lot of content centered around sort of, I'm going to call them mommy wars, quote unquote, right? Stay at home motherhood is beautiful. You should wear a dress and make your own sourdough bread and, you know, be subservient to your husband. And you get a lot of images and content kind of around, like literally I've seen the same floral dress <laughs> on several of my favorite um, moms to follow who love that dress. Okay. And then you get some messages that are like, you can, you know, babies and dreams, you can, you can have it all. You can right now, ballerina farm. Are you familiar with this woman? You know, is I literally asked a mom friend about her today and only started reading about her last night because she's all over the news. <laughs> it's all over the internet because she is like eight days postpartum, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, participating in the Mrs. America pageant. She also was all over the internet with her response to a question, like one of the finalist questions when she was competing, I guess, in the semifinals or whatever it was, but the competition prior to this, uh, where she was answering the question, uh, you know, about empowerment. And she talked about her, her child and again, went all over the internet. So you get those kinds of messages. Um, what do you think? about some of the divisiveness does it make sense to you do you jump in a camp or do you have other opinions i'm really curious yeah great question way, way to make me be divisive by taking a, <laughs> making a comment i will say that i i think to start my answer is everyone holds different views on on social media obviously it bears fruit i'm using social media by being online with you uh youtube and other platforms are great ways to to get messages out um for years i was on social media and back when i was single and i think when you're on social media there's a lot of good that can come your way but a lot of things that can lead you down the path of vice and jealousy and all kinds of, of different things and I remember I found myself back when I was single going through my news feed and seeing basically everything I wanted but didn't have. So every engagement announcement, every wedding picture, every pregnancy announcement and every birth. And I was like, that's not my life. That's not my life. And everything looks so idyllic. And, and there are beautiful things to that. I now live that life. But there's also challenging things that we don't typically post when we're online in those moments. And so I got to a point back when I was single where I was like, this is not good for my mental health. And so um, people can handle social media differently for me. I couldn't handle it well. And so I actually got off and I haven't gone back on. Um, obviously, I'm very present on YouTube and I actually have a lot of videos in that context, but like Facebook, Instagram, all those things. So what I would say in terms of, of all the wars online, I've largely stayed out of the wars. That's why I like this ballerina farm thing. Um, I It's only because I read the news because I want to stay connected to what's going on in the world. So then I did go down a rabbit hole last night. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. <laughs> Watch this video and read this article. And, and um, so I think what's important, whatever we take in, whether it's the news, whether it's social media, um, that we be very careful of compare because then it can lead to despair. And so there are things that we can learn from other people that if it enriches us and helps us grow in virtue, then that is good. Uh, but if it causes us to tear others down and um, also to behave in a way that we wouldn't behave if we were in person. So that's one of the dangers of you know the online world is if you were friends with this woman, would you say some of the things that some people are saying uh, to her face that people seem so free to type online? We really don't know the nitty gritty to even to the degree someone shares about their life online. We can't know um, what life is really like. <laughs> so, so I think the key is the kind of the position I hold is that 
if you can handle that world, then great. I personally can't. And so I, 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 I've had to kind of control and, and limit that. And then, but even, even with mom friends, we still do it, right? Like I'm 29 weeks pregnant right now. And a bunch of my friends at church have just had babies. And, you know, you see that mom whose belly is already flat with her baby at one month postpartum in my mind goes to, that ain't going to be me. It took me months before I lost that belly. So I'm not even online and I'm doing the compare despair thing. So I think um, what matters then is to remember our identity in Christ, that even before we're mothers, we're daughters or sons of a heavenly father who loves us for who we are, because he willed us into existence, because we're made in his image, uh, not because of, you know, how popular we are, how many friends we have in person or online, or how many accomplishments we have. So I've had to realize over the years, yeah, that, that my worth is in being a daughter of the king. And then to realize my, my primary identity after that is, as I say, to be mother. And for men, it's to be father. And for years, that was being a spiritual mother. And, and I feel really blessed, especially looking back in hindsight, as much as I complained about being single for so long, all those single years where I really was able to be a spiritual mother to so many people in the movement, um, people I met on campuses, young students, preborn children, you know, so uh, my nieces and nephews. So so there is, we're, we're ultimately called to motherhood and fatherhood, and that has to be our priority. That's why the religious sister or or brother or father, the religious, you know, whether you're a monk or a priest or, or a nun or a consecrated single, um, their primary call is to maternity or paternity. And any kind of mission work they take on has to be viewed in light of being the best father or mother. And so now I view my life in the same way. So whatever I take on, which is more mission oriented, you know, writing my book, doing a podcast like this, um, giving a talk, um, I am super intentional. I remember the words of um, Catholic speaker and author, Matthew Kelly, who said, the only way to say no to anything is to have a deeper yes. So I say no a lot. Um, and when I say no, I'm saying yes to other things. It's my deeper yes. Um, and when I say yes to maybe some mission oriented ministry based thing, it's because I can balance it well with my primary yes of, of being a mom to Violet and, and this little one and my four littles in heaven. <laughs> if you had to describe it, how would you define, like if you had to put it in one simple sentence, you, you just said it, but I'd love for you to maybe articulate it, um, in a different way if, if you want, if you feel so inclined, but what is that deeper yes? So when you, maybe even just think about the last time you said no to something, mm. what was that deeper yes? And I'm so, you you did just mention your, your children, but is there anything you'd like to add? Yeah, yeah, great question. So yeah, when I look at the deeper yes, I, and again, you can't do it perfectly, but I'll often do a calculation of, will the time away from my family um, in any way be a negative to them that outweighs the positive I could contribute to whatever I'm saying yes to. And, you know, like we'll be online here for 45 to 60 minutes. My daughter's playing with her dad. That's a good thing. She's, she's actually a daddy's girl and he's like the best dad in the world. And so it's like, this is great. Um, so, so no. And then, and then this opportunity to connect with you and your audience and to reach people and, in hopefully impart something that helps them flourish in their life. So, um, even, you know, I have a speaking event coming up in, in June and I've said, uh, can my whole family come? And so my whole family's going. And, and so the new baby will be with us and, and Violet and my husband, and they'll go off and have fun at the, the hotel while, while I go give some talks. So, so it's just um, balancing when I do X, what's going on with Y. And if Y is flourishing and happy and doing well, then it's okay. Hmm. Okay. You've only, you've been at this for two and a half years, right? So this, this, balance. I'm curious, yeah. <laughs> what have you and your husband uh, built in as a, as a way of a, a check-in, so to speak? Like, mm. I'm curious because in my career, this is how 
this is how my public platform launched. Mine was a big form of implosion. Josh and I had not been checking in, or I should say more accurately, he had been trying to check in, but I was too busy um, working 100 hours a week, right? So, so we we had to because of this point of implosion um, that I talk about, you know, uh, in my book, uh, <laughs> my minivan meltdown. Yeah. Uh, that point of implosion, quote unquote, forced us to create some more accountability. I'm so curious, like, what do you and Joe have to kind of continue assessing um, the cadence of stress and activity in your life? Yeah, great question. So. For me, it happened the opposite and it was life's, it was the world circumstances that changed things for me. So I had been 20 plus years traveling, speaking, traveling all the time. Um, and uh, it was 2020 and COVID hit. I met my husband. So even though we started communicating in 2016, then the four years went by. It was, it was January 2020 when he got inspired to reach out to Lila. Um, and so I was able to meet him because I had a speaking event that flew me through Florida literally days before COVID was declared a pandemic. And it was one of my last public speaking events before the world shut down. And so I was still living the very busy life and enjoying it and, you know, thriving overall. I mean, again, there was that part of me that wanted slowness and stability and community and family life, but I didn't have that. So I was just bumbling along and, okay, this, this has its positives and, okay, we're good. And um, then the world shut down. And literally, like, I kept getting the emails. Oh, your event is canceled. Your event is canceled. We could do a Zoom event, but we're not going online anymore. And all this happened literally right when I met my now husband. And so the timing couldn't have been better for my personal life because I suddenly was like, oh, my goodness, I am falling in love. And I, I want to spend time with this guy. And I don't, I don't want to leave him. At exactly when I had no reason to leave because there was almost nowhere for me to go. I, I had a couple events that were still happening, live recordings. But um, so then as my professional life changed dramatically and went online and my personal life went in person and and I, I was suddenly falling in love Um it just worked such that I was like, oh, this slowing down is beautiful. And I know COVID was very hard for a lot of people, without a doubt. I was one of the people for whom COVID actually, like, I, I often say if, if COVID hadn't happened, my wedding would have had more than 500 people at it. Like, it just would be so hard not to, you know, invite the world. But because it was during COVID, we had 19 people, you know. Oh, my gosh. You were a COVID wedding. Yeah. We got married that August. We got married that August. Oh, yeah. wow. In the beautiful. Yeah state of Florida. Yeah. Did you get married? In yeah, well, no, that's a whole other story. We ended up getting married in Phoenix, <laughs> which was during a, during a heat wave. Uh, but, but yeah, in, in the U S <laughs> so, I love it so much. So, yeah. So all that to say, um, life slowed down professionally right when it ramped up personally so that it actually was easier for me to not do as much professionally because I wasn't so that now Joe and I kind of run with the philosophy from the book Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less by Greg McCown. Love that book. Um, and one of the things he talks about is if it's not a, a heck yeah or a hell yeah, as they say in the book, but if it's not a heck yeah, it's a no. So when I get requests or events, Joe and I will often just have a quick discussion. How is this resonating with both of us? Is it a heck yeah or not? And then we go from there. So good. It's a great question, to be honest. Anybody can say that. Like, mm -hmm. is this a heck yeah? You might have to define a few things around what yeah. Heck, yeah. heck yeah, but it's wonderful. Um, it's very important. This is so, so important, whether you are working at all or not. It's it's so important. My Body for You is a very tender book. There's a, a beautiful, your, your friend Lila Rose, she describes in the quote on the front, Stephanie Gray Connors is a uniquely wise and winsome voice. I had to Google the word winsome, but winsome is an incredible word to describe this book. I would say this reads part memoir, part um, how to in a way, uh, and 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 truly is just it's a very tender book. Um, and so I guess the last thing I'd love to ask you is. Um, You've got four babies in heaven. I have one in heaven. And the section that you wrote about how it reminds you that our life is not meant for here. Yeah. I I just, that made me weep. 
you know, and, and I think sometimes in my life I can, I'm very achievement driven. I love ticking things off boxes. I get very excited about progress. And when I'm not able to make progress, it makes me frustrated. Um, I have control, a lot of control issues. Longtime listeners know all of this about me. Um, but my miscarriage gave a very different view of uh, eternity because I, I feel very connected to someone who's not here. Mm -hmm. And you speak about that so beautifully um, in the book. Uh, but, but, but what I want to ask you is, um, what would you, what, what would you say to anyone who he feels that despair even mm -hmm. before and might even be fearful of being pregnant again, which you describe so beautifully in the book um, or honestly in the book, uh, what, what would your counsel be? To somebody who has gone through this many times yeah to to not lose heart and realize that healing takes time and that god works on our heart slowly so as not to crush it and um you know when i first got pregnant within the first month of our marriage i got pregnant and i remember thinking there was a chance i was pregnant and I remember journaling God, because uh, my mom has had one miscarriage. My sister hasn't had any. And I remember journaling, God, if I am pregnant, I just want you to know I only want to be pregnant if it's if I don't lose this baby. And I knew there was kind of like a high rate of first pregnancy miscarriages. And um, so then we were excited to discover we were pregnant and then we lost that baby. And then we had Violet right after. And then I've just lost three babies in just, well, before getting pregnant with this one in, in almost a year, um, I, I lost three in a row. And I remember with the fourth loss saying to my husband, I never want to get pregnant again. And that was a natural reaction. I think the first reaction of, I don't want to be pregnant if I'm going to lose this baby and then losing several babies and being like, I don't want to ever get pregnant again, are natural reactions to suffering because we don't like to hurt. We don't like to suffer. And so the thought of, I don't want to lose a child. I don't want to get pregnant again in case I lose another child are natural reactions, but it doesn't mean we should stay in that place. And um, over time through prayer, through the support of my husband, a, a very wonderful doctor, and you know, we've alluded to your guiding star project, but the world of restorative reproductive medicine, who's journeyed with us through five of our six pregnancies. Um, you know, I my heart softened. We're we're told in the old testament, um, God says, I will take your heart of stone and I will replace it with a heart of flesh. And I felt that. Uh, the Lord took what I had hardened in my heart very naturally through the suffering of losing children I so desperately wanted. And he replaced it with the heart of flesh that could say, I'm willing to receive life from you, more life from you, not knowing how long I'll get this life on this earth, knowing that I will ultimately be reunited with that life in heaven. And as, as you said in your question, like I came to this realization, the value of of my children is not in how long, speaking of, I know you said your new baby might make an appearance. Oh. I'm hungry. Keep going. You're so beautiful. What a cutie. I love her. <laughs> That'll be me in uh, two and a half months. <laughs> um, but I realized in that feeling of not wanting to be pregnant again or not wanting to be pregnant if I was going to lose the baby was in what I hadn't yet put words to was this attitude of, I'll only want the kid if I get the kid long enough to raise the child, to be with the child, to feel loved by the child and, and, and love the child in, in a, for a length of time. And then I had to come to this realization, oh my gosh, the value of my children is not in how long I get them in this world. The value of my children is that they're made in God's image and that he has bestowed this life on me at a time frame that is on his timing, not mine. And that ultimately they are meant to be in heaven as I'm meant to be in heaven. And I will have the chance to spend eternity with them. And they've already got there. And they're now our intercessors as a family praying for us. Um, as, as we are pilgrims on this journey on earth, learning to love better until we get to love the best in heaven. And so I, I, I thought, okay, like, do I want to be 80 and look back and always wonder if we had just been open to trying again, 
is it possible that baby would have made it to birth unlike the other ones? Um, there was a chance that wouldn't happen. And so when we were open to getting pregnant again, there was a chance we were going to have another miscarriage. And so far, you know, we've been very blessed to be 29 weeks along with this little one in my womb and, and everything is looking good. And um, but even still, we have no guarantee. Will we have our children after birth for two years or five years or 10 years or 80 years? We don't know. Um, but can we love the life we've been given regardless of whether it's long or short? And so it's been time. It's been prayer. It's been a supportive community that have made my heart get to that place. So for anyone who's struggling, you know, I would say, you know, don't beat yourself up. Um, but run to the cross. Don't don't run away from God. You know, sit in silence, sit in prayer, journal. Um, you know, a dear priest friend, when we were miscarrying, one of our babies came to our house and just played the piano. And I hadn't yet passed the child. And I remember just sitting on the couch sobbing, but with gratitude that he was blessing us with the gift of music. You know, and I've often heard like music expresses words when verbalization fails us, you know, and so just to experience the, the, the beauty that other people can offer in a time of darkness and know that the lights eventually will come back on and to give yourself the space, the time and the prayer needed, as well as get that supportive community. Um, as I mentioned, we, we've had a, a wonderful doctor in the world of restorative reproductive medicine who's journeyed with us for four, five of six pregnancies. I credit him with saving the life of our daughter, Violet, because he administered progesterone during uh, the first half of that pregnancy. And we did wonder if we lost our first child because of low levels of progesterone, which is a very real possibility. Um, I was on progesterone for the next three. We lost those babies, but I'm, I've been back on it with this one until a couple weeks ago. Um, and he, this time he also has me on a baby aspirin. There's some theory that that can decrease miscarriage risk. And so in the first trimester, he's like, there's no harm and possible benefit. Um, so to have someone in your life who's really doing everything possible to keep your babies alive, but then to have the spiritual support in your life to realize they will ultimately always live in heaven. And I'm to love and steward their lives until God is ready to take them home. Um, that has that has given me help. Oh, the human and the spiritual. It's so important. We have both. You can't yeah. You can't just have one. You you really do need both. My body for you, a pro-life message for a post-row world. I'm so excited to share that my listeners can take advantage of 10% off with the coupon code CANNING10. And the link where you can go pick up her book is in the description of this video, whether you're watching it live or you're listening. Go and check it out. St. Paul Center, CANNING10 for 10% off. Is there anything else, Stephanie? that you want to mention that you didn't get a chance to today? Uh, you know, I think in the middle of my book, um, I, I share an experience I had with someone who had once protested a pro-life display uh, that I had done years ago when I was a student at the University of British Columbia. He was a, a Jewish student who seven years after I had graduated from campus, wrote me an apology email for protesting. And... Um, then he and I connected. He wanted to apologize in person for trying to shut down my pro-life exhibit. And I met his wife at the only, like one of the only kosher restaurants in Vancouver. And then years after that, uh, he and his wife invited me to their home with their children for a Passover meal. And I reflect in the book just on just this remarkable experience of two people that had been on opposite sides of the fence in a sense there'd been such tension um and yet there was reconciliation and yet even though there were still differences here were they orthodox jews and me uh, a practicing catholic nonetheless united over this beautiful old testament story that both parties embraced of uh god's rescuing love for his people the israelites and and leading them to freedom um, and I reflect on how Jesus, uh, God saved the Jews through the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. And then I use that as a bridge to then reflect on the new Passover and how uh, Jesus was, as John the Baptist declared, the lamb of God. Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so we have the chance to uh, be spared death by the blood of the new lamb, who is Jesus. And Jesus 
showed us that through laying down his life on the cross and saying, this is my body given for you. And so I think I would just want my parting message to be encouragement for people to really enter into both the Old and the New Testament stories of the Passover and what Jesus did and that his laying down his life, getting up on the cross um, is something we're all called to. And motherhood and fatherhood in very unique and beautiful ways um, are opportunities for us to live that out and pay that forward to others. The, the self-sacrificing love of the cross that Jesus gave to us is what we can do, you know, in the dramatic way of pregnancy and birth for our children, but also in the seemingly less dramatic ways of everyday life of laying down our lives for the flourishing of others. And that that ultimately is what we're made for and what will, even when it's hard, bring about our fulfillment, happiness and eternal joy. So um, that's that's what comes to mind. Even when it's hard, this will bring about our uh, fulfillment and eternal joy. That's a great line to end on. Where can people go to learn more about you and your work, Stephanie Gray Connors? Yes. Yeah, so my website is loveunleasheslife.com. There's links to the book there. Also for the book, people can just go to the stpaulcenter.com slash my body for you. And then as you say, put in your code and, and they'll get a discount. So. <laughs> so great to spend some time with you, Stephanie. I'm so grateful for you and all the ways that you lay down your life for the greater good. Thank you. Well, God bless you.